All right, so I know I've been talking about a lot of government stuff recently, but it's a bit hard to, to get away from it because it's, it's what's been on my mind. So I thought uh, what I would talk about this morning, the title of my sermon is Subject Unto the Higher Powers. Subject Unto the Higher Powers. And I just thought I would touch on this topic because obviously a lot of Christians, I don't think any of us are mixed up on this, but I think a lot of Christians out there be just believe that whatever the government does, uh, that Christians should obey uh, without question. Um, and even uh, people that go against the government now that may not be sinful things, they think those Christians should not be doing that either. So I wanted to talk a bit about that and talk about when we ought to disobey our government and look at some examples in the Bible. So first of all, we'll look at the fact that government, human government is ordained by God in the sense that system is ordained by God. Just like God has ordained within a family that there is a structure, right? There's a father, there's a mother, and the children submit, and the mother submits to the father, and, and there's a structure within that family. God has also ordained government, where men are meant to rule over one another in terms of enforcing laws and things like that. And different governments obviously have different types of government um, that they implement. You know, in, in Australia, it's a constitutional monarchy. So if you don't know what that means, a constitutional monarchy is we have a constitution, we have the rule of law, but we're a monarchy, meaning we still submit, we're still under the, the UK crown, right? We're still under the queen. But our parliament is a, is a parliamentary democracy. So that's why we're able to vote and we're able you know, to, to, to engage in political discussion. And that's why um, in Australia we have what's called in, implied freedom of political um, discussion because if we are meant to be a parliamentary democracy and we're meant to vote and things like that, then you can't uh, stop people from discussing politics and, and discussing points of view in order to decide who they're going to support in par Parliament. So that's why uh, you see things like we have implied, you know, Im implied rights and we have these implied freedoms because if there's one constitutional law and then something must support that, the courts have found, hey, it, it, you must support freedom of political expression because you're a parliamentary democracy. So that's how that sort of reasoning works. And people believe in different things. So, you know, America is a different type of government to ours. It's, it's, it's similar, but a little bit different. I think ours is more like the UK because obviously America is split from the UK. So they, they establish a different form of government. You have obviously dictatorships, you have kingdoms. Um, you also have, uh, all, you know, you have people that believe in anarchy, right? You have people that believe, well, there shouldn't be a government. You know, they should, I should just be able to rule myself and it's just free contracts and things like that. So I'm not, I, you know, I understand that people think like that and people think, oh, you know, well, you, you can voluntarily submit yourself to a government. But if you are running a society and we're following God's plans, where God's is, people would call that like a theocracy, where God's laws are the laws of a land rather than man creating a constitution. That's how a government should be run. So even if people voluntarily join a nation, that's how the nation should be run, where people are, you know, judges are raised up and judge according to God's laws. So I firmly believe that, you know, there shouldn't be, an, a society shouldn't be anarchistic, right? It shouldn't be anarchy. There shouldn't be no uh, ruling people that are judges deciding on things and ruling over uh, to keep things in order. I think God has, uh, has made this very clear where he has ordained powers that be and, and given uh, power from his word in government. Uh, even uh, in the church, it's the same, right? Church has leadership. Church has a structure and God gives authority to those in charge in order to rule in those different kingdoms. So you can see family is like a kingdom, church is like a kingdom, and then you have the country, like nations are a kingdom as well. So in Romans 13, we read here, uh, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And this is where people get it wrong, first of all. I mean, how many times have you seen Christians quote Romans 13 as, as though that's supporting just blindly obeying the government, right? Just blindly obeying whatever law the government passes, whatever direction they give, you know, we should just obey it. No, because the Bible says here, and the King James Bible in, in particular says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So yes, there is authority. Right? Like in, in all our lives, there's authority in our lives. At, at your work, you're subject to your boss. You know, in your home, you may be subject to your parents. In your marriage, you may be subject to your husband. And, you know, in, in our government, we have higher powers, which are the, the, pow the, the leaders and the parliamentary democracy that we find ourselves in. But that's not the highest power, right? The highest power is God. The highest power is the Bible. 
So when the Bible says, let every sub soul be subject unto the higher powers, it's alluding to the fact that there is authority in our lives. But that doesn't mean the government is the highest authority in this nation. God is the highest authority. And that's why we always have to take into account any law that the government passes. Do we have to keep it? Do we have to obey it if it contradicts with God's laws? So not every law that is given you know, we, we ought to the best of our abilities be law abiding citizens. But when the law is contrary to God's law, then it's a duty to break those laws, right? Because uh, we are called to be uh, servants of God first rather than servants of our government. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And, and that's interesting because even you remember when Jesus was speaking uh, to Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate said, hey, don't you know I have the power to crucify thee and to let you go? And remember what Jesus said to him? Yeah, you don't have any power of me except it was given you from above. Mm. So that's where he's acknowledging that, you know, yeah, you have power. But just remember, the only reason why you even have power in this world is because God allows you to have power. And God has ordained it that way. Uh, not that, you know, because you are anything special. So the powers that be are ordained of God. That doesn't necessarily, but what I'm not saying there is, I'm not saying that everyone that is in power means that they, they are there, they're put there by God, right? So you have obviously God raising up kings. So God ultimately allows them to be there, but that doesn't mean God, it was God's will for them to be there, right? So whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Why is it saying that? It's saying, hey, if you resist the authority that's there, you're resisting the ordinance of God because God has put it there. Why? What's the purpose that God has put authority in our lives and government in our lives? For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. See, this is how you know that you are under an oppressive authority. It doesn't matter in, in any area of your life, right? If you think about if, if you're under an oppressive management at work, or if you're under an oppressive, you know, your parents are being oppressive, right? Or your government is being oppressive. Or if your church is being oppressive. How do you know that? Because when you do good and, and you're, if you're scared of doing good or you're, or you're reprimanded or you're punished for doing good, that's when you know something is wrong. Because authority is there not to be, look, a terror to good works, but to the evil. So you know you're under a good authority when evil is punished, right? When wrongdoing is spoken against as opposed to what is right. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. So what it's saying there is because that the government is there for that reason, to punish evildoers and to praise them that are good, then you should be afraid of it too about doing evil. But you ought not be afraid if you are doing good because the same minister that is there of God ought to be lifting up and praising people that are good and acknowledging people that are good as well as showing an example of what is bad. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. So you notice there that the authority of government is there to actually execute vengeance, execute God's wrath. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So does government have the right and the authority to punish criminals? Yes. And they have that authority from God. And this is why when you wonder when Jesus was dealing with the woman who was caught in adultery and they came, oh, you know, she should be stoned. Why did he not just command her to be stoned? A lot of people misunderstand that story. Well, it's because he's not the government. You know, he's, he, Jesus there is under Roman rule. So it's not up to individuals to execute judgment. It's not up to us as a church as well. Like if somebody commits a crime that we just execute judgment like on a criminal level, it's not for a church to do, right? Because we are under a system of government. But that's the government's job. So that's why government has the right to execute criminals, ex cap carry out capital punishment, carry out you know, punishment of crime and issue fines or whatnot. Uh, because that's what God has ordained them to do. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. 
So what does that mean? What is that saying? That's saying, hey, well, you have to be subject to the government, not only because you will be scared, because if you do something wrong, they're going to come after you, but also government is saying for conscience sake, this, what I believe this means is because government should be setting sort of like a, an example of what is right and wrong. So you can, so you're meant to be able to gauge the government to see, hey, what they're doing is right and wrong. But you know, not every government, obviously, uh, you know, it's all topsy turvy now in the world we live in. For for this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So notice here that, you know, people who say, uh, you know, all taxation is theft or, you know, taxation is stealing from us and no taxation should be there. No, I believe there is a place for taxation, right? And I guess what level is determined by whoever's in, in rule, right? So, you know, in our country, the level of taxation is the way it is because we've allowed it to get the way it is because we're in a democracy, right? Because everybody has voted and, and majority keeps increasing taxes and keeps paying for everyone. So that's why it's so high in our country. But, you know, when it comes to a kingdom, a king may just set a tax and I guess it's up to people whether they want to rebel against that king or whether they want to leave and join another nation. So there is an authority here for authority to collect taxes, to collect tribute in order to carry out what God has um, ordained for them to do, which is to punish the evildoers and to praise them that are good. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. So we see here that it is not God's will for us to not pay taxes at all. Right? There is a duty of a citizen to pay taxes to the government in order for the government to do the job that God has ordained them to do. And that's why even when people, if you remember, came to Jesus and they, and they said, you know, does your, does your master pay tribute? What did you do? He went to go get a fish. I don't know if you guys remember the story. You go catch a fish and the fish opens his mouth, there's a piece of money in it and they gave that to them to pay the taxes. So he did, he did pay taxes and he said, render therefore to Caesar the things which are Caesar's and render therefore to God the things which are God's. So um, it shows that Jesus did support, you know, paying uh, his lawful taxes. And I, say, and I say lawful, and I will uh, talk about that in a moment. All right, so here we see a similar passage in 1 Peter 2, where you see the same idea. So it says here in 1 Peter 2, 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So notice, it's not in total disregard to what God says. We keep the laws, but we also we do it for the Lord's sake. And this is the same thing when you talk about rights. You know, when people, now I've got trolls on my page saying like, oh, you know, now this, because now when, you, when people hear about you, they're scanning through all your Facebook posts, right, to see if they can find thing. And what can they find? Oh, I'm against the homos, right? I'm not against homosexuality. So they're like, oh, you know, how, how are you for, you know, you're fighting for exercising your rights, you're fighting for human rights, but you, you know, but you're against homosexuality. What do you think the LGBTQ community thinks about you? And I just think, I mean, it's not news. I'm a Christian. I mean, is it, is, it, is it news that I'm against homosexuality? But at the same time, we need, to re we, we need to recognize that rights are not just things that you just come up with. You know, your human rights is just not whatever you want to do. That's why we say they, they're God-given rights, right? They come, our rights come from God. They don't just come from anywhere. They just come from people's opinions. So because they're God-given rights, no, you don't have the right to commit adultery. You don't have the right to commit bestiality and you don't have the right to commit homosexuality. So homosexuality is not a human right, right? So there, there are, there are right, our rights are what are allowed by, by God. It's not just whatever you want to do. So it's like if somebody wants to commit murder, no, you don't have that right. That's why you don't have a right to abortion because you don't have the right to commit murder. You, know, you don't have the right to steal and all, all sorts of things. So obviously there are certain sins that are outlawed that you don't have a right to. But there are certain sins that are sins, but are not outlawed, and you have a right to commit those sins. That doesn't mean you ought to commit those sins. So it's like with, with drugs, right? Does somebody have the right to, to shoot themselves up with heroin? Well, they do have that right. Should they do it? No. And, and whether or not it becomes criminal later on and all that sort of stuff will come to negligence and who it affects, and that's for the courts to decide and whatnot. So, you know, do I think somebody who's like a drunk and they've known, they're known, um, Let's say somebody gets drunk the first time um, and then they, uh, you know, they drive and, and, they, and they kill somebody. Should that be murder? It's like, well, 
You know, the judge might decide, no, that's manslaughter because it's like a one-off and, you know, they're not normally known to drunk drivers. Like, so it's like, okay, well, we'll let them off so it's like manslaughter. But let's say somebody's known for drinking and driving and then they've been warned and it's like, oh, you know, we keep telling this guy, hey, you ought not drink and drive, you know, because you're a bloody idiot, you know. So they drink and drive and they know they've done it a few times. They're known to do that. And then that, when they, now they dri drive, they drink and drive and they kill somebody. And then people are saying, hey, well, this guy, he's known to be a drunkard. He's known to have done that many times. He's been warned. Then people might say, well, that's capital punishment then you know, because that's neglect. And we see sort of that in the Bible uh, where, and I'm kind of getting a bit off topic here, but this is interesting because, you know, there's a law in the Bible where if, you're an, if you own a, an ox and your ox kills somebody and it's not known to have done that in the past, then that's manslaughter, right? Uh, and, and I think there's just a fine that's paid and, and whatnot. But if that ox is known to have been aggressive and known to have attacked people before and you did not sufficiently keep it in and it kills somebody, now that's like murder. So it's like, uh, if you think about today, it'd be like if you had a dog that was an aggress aggressive dog and it was like all of a sudden it just attacked somebody, you may not get into less trouble than if people knew, hey, that was an aggressive dog, it's attacked people before, now it's killed somebody, now you've been in neglect, you know, you knew that that could have happened and you didn't. So laws are quite interesting where it depends on the scenario and you can draw principles even, you know, with uh, a, a neglect with, a, with an aggressive animal, you can draw the principle even with drunk driving. So we see it for the Lord's sake. So you don't just have a right to do whatever you want. We have God-given rights. And it's interesting that even when now we're looking into this constitutional law stuff, that when, when our constitution comes from the UK constitution, right? Because we kind of inherit their system. And when they acknowledge God, you know what they're acknowledging? They're acknowledging the King James Bible. Isn't that cool? So they're acknowledging because that's their Bible yep. that they used. So, and that's why when, when they are saying, hey, when they're acknowledging Almighty God, they're not just acknowledging every God, every false God that's out there that anybody wants to believe. They are acknowledging the God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the framework in which our laws are derived. So I don't think it's wrong for us to say that we are a Christian nation when our laws are meant to be derived and acknowledging the God of the Bible. But I think people are, are trying to definitely get away from that. Um, but it's something interesting to know. Or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So you see that similarity with Romans 13, that govern, governors and government is there to punish evildoers. That's their purpose and the praise of them that do well. And that's why I say it's not the government's job to be running education and running health care and running charities and all this sort of stuff, bailing people out, giving people money that they're printing from nowhere. This is, this is not government's role at all. 1 Peter 2.15 For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So there we see government being ordained by God and what uh, purpose God has for government. So when, the question, two, the two scenarios I want to talk about today is when should we disobey our government? Right? When should we disobey our government? Now the first one is quite obvious, right? The first one is obvious when government has laws that, contra that, that are contrary to God's laws. That's when we have the right by God to disobey those laws because we submit to the higher power. So I've got a couple of examples here. And the first one is Daniel. Man, when you read Daniel, doesn't Daniel's life put you to shame? You know? So I thought we'd read here with Daniel and Daniel's boldness when he was told by his government not to pray to God or to any other God. Daniel 6 verse 4. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. I mean, does that not ring true? Remember when we, when we read in 1 Peter 2, and it says here, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance 
of foolish men. And then we go to Daniel, and Daniel is the example of what's being taught in Romans 13 and in 1 Peter 2, where they couldn't say anything against him. So if anything, he was a law-abiding citizen. And what did they have to find against him? It was something that he believed, something that he stood for uh, with God. So it says here, look, we can't, we can't find any occasion against this Daniel. He's saying we can't, see, we can't fault him for what he's doing. He's living a blameless life, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And sometimes I wonder, I'm not talking myself up here, but sometimes I wonder, is that what the trolls of my age are trying to do? So they're trying to find something. It's like, ah, it's like, damn it. This guy's like just some regular guy. And it's like, ah, he doesn't like the homos. That's what, you know, it's like something against him and his God. It's something that you believe. That's the only thing you can fault. So you want to try and live a life as best as that as possible. Where somebody looks at your life, if somebody had to try and find fault in your life, could they find anything? Would the only thing that they could find fault in your life is the things you believe? If the only thing people can find out about your life is the things you believe, then it's like, hey, you can at least take some solace. Like, hey, I'm on the right track, right? If, if that's the only thing that people can find fault with. Amen. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius lived forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So this is where, you know, I guess Daniel puts me to shame. Daniel puts all of us to shame where, you know, he was given a decree here. But what's going on here? It's saying you can't pray to anybody except uh, to, to any other god except to the king so they're trying to put the king up as a god and notice that this is a temporary law so it's very it's very it's very uh, well, it's, it's very applicable to how where we find ourselves right where a temporary law was put in place but what was daniel's response he says now a king establish the decree so this is where they're putting it in place sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the medes and persians which altereth not so they pass this you know, how, how they put this law into place and they, they enforced it throughout the land. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Look at this. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew that the writing was signed. So notice that Daniel did not do this ignorantly. He didn't go, like, just do it and, and did, had no idea what was going on in the government. It said, hey, when he knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being open unashamedly, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So what happened? Nothing changed. He just continued as he was. And that's Daniel. So there's one example where we ought to disobey the government. We disobey the government when it is contrary to God's laws. Acts 5. Here's one in the New Testament, an example, with the apostles where they're disobeying the authorities that are there at that time. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which, which in the sect of the Sadducee, Sadducees and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So this is a quite a funny story in Acts 5. But So they're preaching, the high priest and the Sadducees don't lie, they put them into prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So they get thrown into prison. A miracle happens where an angel opens the prison doors. They then go back out, tell them to just go back as you were before and keep preaching in the temple. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came. And they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them, whereunto this would grow. So they went to go get them in the prison, but they're not there anymore, right? And they're saying even the people that are, you know, in prison are on guard, maybe they're back on their shift again. But when they opened the doors, they were gone. So they must have gone when maybe all the, uh, the prison guards were asleep and whatnot. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison 
are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So finally they find them. And they're like, where are these people? Where I can't find them in the prison. Oh, they're back in the temple. When you told them they shouldn't be preaching there. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. So interesting there that even the authorities then, if there is enough people that don't agree with what the authorities are doing, that you can see here that the authorities actually fear the people. Um, so it's just interesting. I just think about the example we find ourselves in the city uh, at this time where, you know, I'm going out there and exercising and uh, there was a big uproar over what happened the week prior and this week, you know, what happened? Nothing, you know, and they let me be. Um, I just find that interesting. It's like, this is what this reminded me of. They feared the people lest they should have been stoned. Whereas here in Australia, you won't, you're not stoned necessarily physically, but maybe stoned verbally. Um, so I don't know if you saw, like, once all that happened last week, everyone was just, like, flooding the New South Wales Police Facebook. Uh, you know, the post came up, and then people were just, like, flooding it with comments. I'm like, how oh, dare you, know? And they keep taking those posts down and whatnot. So, obviously, it was a bit of a PR nightmare to them, but um, it's interesting. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest and asked them, saying, did what we straightly command you, that you should not teach in this name, and behold, you've filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. So even back here, it's about censorship, isn't it? That's why they persecute people. That's why they take people's platforms away, because they're trying to censor a message. Because you know what? A message is too powerful. It's hard to contain. That's why when things go viral, it's hard to contain a message that goes out and goes viral. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. What are they saying? You're making us look bad. That's why they're censoring things. And that's what's happening as well with this whole pandemic. They're trying to censor information because it's making them look bad, right? Because they can see that the data doesn't line up. They can see that they've made foolish choices. And if people wake up to it, they're going to, they, because they fear the people ultimately, and especially in a democracy, because if people wake up to these facts, they're going to lose office. They're not going to get elected. So it's making them look bad. Then Peter and the apostles answered and said, look at this, we ought to obey God rather than men. I'll skip over the next example for sake of time, but the next example I had was the midwives in Egypt when they were told to kill all the babies or kill all the, 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 the men that were born. And they said, no, we're not going to. Right? So there was a law that was given to commit abortions, right? to murder children. And... They disobey, and God said they were praised for it. And I always find it, it interesting, this last passage here in Exodus 1, it says, God dealt well with the midwives. The people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. Yeah. Just think like that. So I don't know whether that means you know, God just maybe uh, get, put it in the hearts of people to provide houses for the midwives, you know, because God works through men as well. But it's interesting there that God, because of what the midwives do, God got directly involved and made sure that those that were doing right were provided for. Right? Um, so that's the example in Exodus 1. I just want to show you here as well two examples where, you know, well, people will say, oh, you know, not, a, not only should you not disobey the government, but, oh, you know, you're so disrespectful as a Christian, you know, uh, speaking out against our politicians and, you know, they deserve our respect and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, how can you, you know, say these things against them and talk about them this way and speak against them? And you just think some of these Christians, I don't know if they've ever read their Bibles. You know, they don't read in the Bible how many people have spoken against the authorities. I mean, Jesus spoke against the authorities. Paul spoke against the authorities. John the Baptist. So I just want to show you a couple of examples here. Just one from the Old Testament where we see Nathan coming in, the prophet Nathan had the boldness to come in and speak directly to the king and not just, not just even a wicked king, to King David himself and say, look, this is what you have done wrong. You are the man. And I won't go into the whole story because it's quite familiar to us. But prior to this, prior to this verse here, Nathan has come to David and given him like this parable and say like, oh, you know, there's this rich man that comes and uh, you know, he wants to have a feast. And then there's this poor man that has this one ewe lamb and he's raised it up his whole life. And instead of like taking one from his own flock, he takes the, the, the little ewe lamb from this, this, this other man. 
And this is where David responds. He says, what should be done with this man that's taken this little ewe lamb of this person? And obviously and the analogy there is that David has multiple wives and he's the rich man. And, and Uriah who has Bathsheba, his one wife, that he's raised up. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. So isn't it funny that, you know, when... David doesn't realize it's him that's being spoken about. He judges righteous judgment. He actually is overzealously judging, right? Because why, why should somebody die for taking somebody's, feeding himself with somebody's sheep, right? So that, that should just be paid back. So he's so overzealous in his judgment, you know, to see like, oh, look how righteous I am. Like, oh man, that person should die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And then he goes into, Hey, this is what you've done. You've taken Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And um, obviously David responds well, and we, and we know the rest of that story. But here as well, so that's an Old Testament example of the prophets. And, and there's many examples of the prophets approaching wicked kings and, and rebuking, you know, you think of Elijah rebuking King Ahab. But I just wanted to show you that example because even a, a man after God's own heart, King David, was not free from the rebuke of God's people, right? The rebuke of a righteous man saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Luke 3.16, we see John the Baptist here. You know, greatest man born among women, admitted by Jesus Christ himself. And here he is in many instances. You wonder, why was John the Baptist jailed? Why was John the Baptist put in prison? Was he put in prison because he just preached the gospel unashamedly, baptizing people? Was he persecuted for, for, for doing the, the work of the ministry? No, that's, that's not why he was put in jail. Well, not, not for doing that stuff. Obviously, preaching against sin is the work of the ministry too. But look at what he was put in jail for, if you don't know. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you. I'll skip over this for a second. So this is what John is doing. So we're talking about John here. It says many other things, verse 18 there. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch. So who's Herod? I believe they're called the Tetrarchs because they're one of the four that are ruling. So there's like, there was Pontius Pilate in Judea. And then there was um, Herod and there was two others that are mentioned in Luke 3 at the beginning. I think that's why they're called Tetrarchs. It seems that under, under Siberius, uh, Tiberius Caesar, he had like four rulers under him. So I think that's why they called the Tetrarchs. That's just my guess. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So why did Herod not like John the Baptist, not like his preaching? Not, why did he shut him up in prison? Because Herod... Uh, because John the Baptist was telling Herod, hey, it's not right that you are taking your brother's wife, right? that he was committing adultery. So that's why he was thrown in prison. So when people say like, oh, you know, you're disrespectful towards politicians, disrespectful, you're calling out the evils that they're doing, the corruption, the hypocrisy, whatever that they're doing, oh, you ought not to be doing that because you're meant to be respecting the authorities. Hey, we're just following the example that's set in the Bible. Where people that are ruling, like the religious leaders and the people that are in charge, they are under public scrutiny, right? And anybody making big decisions. That's why, you know, I'm glad that that Neil Ferguson, who's, you know, with his dodgy studies, has ruined the economies of countries around the world. And came out, what was he doing? He was committing adultery during the lockdowns, right? I don't know if you saw that in the news. So during the lockdowns, while he's telling everyone to stay at home and keep the numbers down, save lives, you know, stay home, he's having his, you know, married mistress over uh, multiple times and, and sleeping and having adultery and committing adultery with her. Um, so I'm glad that this comes out, right? Because I think the people that are, you know, are in public office and in public, in the public sphere ought to be condemned publicly when they do things as atrocious as adultery. And why, why are people like, oh, you know, don't in his personal life? Yeah, because they think it's fine to commit adultery. They think it's fine to just fornicate. Oh, that's his personal life. No, according to God, adultery is meant to be a capital punishment crime. This is a very serious thing that people are doing, and it ought to be known. It ought to be out there. 
Now, what's a what's a more uh, uh, what's this uh, like a, a a more tricky one for people to get their head around? Because what you have to understand is when we talk about submitting to the higher powers, when do we disobey government? Obviously, we disobey government when government passes laws that are contrary to God's laws. But what you also have to understand is another time you can disobey government is when government or people in power are passing laws that are contrary to the powers that they have even in their own country. Right? So just because governments and people in charge do something, that doesn't also always mean what they're doing is actually lawful. Right? It's actually uh, like according to the laws in the land. And we see this all the time. When then, and this is what we talk about, government overreach. You know, government overreach is not only infringing on our God-given rights, but government overreach is sometimes when they do things and it's contrary to its own, to the own constitution of its land. You know, like if you talk about, let's say, let's say the land, like in America is a good example, right? They have the freedom of speech and freedom of religion and things like that. So government can't infringe on those. If they do, they're breaking their own laws. And it's the duty of the citizens to uphold those laws that they actually were meant to take an oath to uphold. So I want to show you a couple of examples in the Bible where um, we see people upholding their rights in the Bible. Right? So one is where we see Jesus, what well, well, a lot of people believe, Jesus exercising, exercising his right to silence, right? exercising his right not to speak, even when authorities are asking him questions. So if an authority asks you questions, you're not necessarily expected to obey that if you have a right to silence. Luke 23. So we see here that Jesus, we know that Jesus speaks to Pilate. right? So remember, Pilate is what I understand is one of the four that are helping uh, Tiberius Caesar rule um, at this time in the Roman Empire. So Pilate speaks to Jesus because we know the sort of things that Jesus has said to Pilate. It says, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. So they're asking, he's asking Jesus, oh, you're of Galilee. And as soon as he knew that he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction, so this is outside of Pilate's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time time and when herod saw jesus he was exceeding glad for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he had hoped to have seen some miracle done by him then he questioned him uh, in many words look at jesus response but he answered him nothing so there's a couple of things going on here a lot of people believe that because well john the baptist if you remember was preaching to herod and that was sort of like God's way to speak to Herod and, and you know he killed John the Baptist he put him in prison ended up decapitating him because of some promise he made to you know um, Herodias's daughter so this the symbolism here can also be that you know God God's word in your life can get cut off you know if you don't if you don't listen to what God if the unbeliever doesn't listen to what God has to say to them eventually it can become too late but God no longer talks to them because now Herod has the word of God in the flesh, standing before him, wanting to know something from him, and Jesus decides not to say anything, just decides to keep quiet. So there's two, that's why I think there can be two things going on here. One is the word of God now no longer is being spoken to King Herod. But also we see Jesus here knowing his rights, right? knowing that he doesn't have to say anything just because Herod is demanding it of him. So it's like that. You can disobey when it's contrary to the laws of the land. And that's why, you know, when you see me talking to the police and they're demanding things and I'm talking back, it's not the unchristian thing to do because if the police are asking for things they have no right to ask for, you are well within your right and well within your, your, your um, responsibilities as a Christian to stand up for those rights and to question that authority when they are disobeying a higher authority. You know, because you have, you have the right not to incriminate yourself. You have the right to remain silent. So when they're trying to get you to incriminate yourself, you don't need to. You can be silent or you can ask whether they even have a right to ask you that question. Now, how you do it may, may change your outcome. So I'm not necessarily saying you want to be aggressive because sometimes you know, when people are aggressive or they resist the power, you know, that doesn't mean that there's not necessarily violence that they can inflict on you. 
Um, so that's where we have to appeal to the courts and whatnot to get justice. So we see here Jesus exercising his right to silence. In Acts 25, we see here Paul as well. He is wary of his rights being a Roman citizen because remember here they are under Roman rule. And in Roman rule, they would have rights as well, sort of similar to what we have. And we see here they also have this rule of law and this court system that they can appeal to and judges that sit. And we see here in this example that Paul is knowledgeable of those things and how he appeals to not be subject to the Jews. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. So notice that they're in a court here and the Jews are uh, trying to accuse him before you know, the judge that he's sitting before, uh, which is Festus here. While he answered for himself, neither against, while he, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, so he's saying, I'm not guilty here, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all? But Festus, look at this, willing to do the Jews a pleasure. Right, so answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? So notice here, Paul is standing before this sort of judge here, Festus at the time. And they're hearing his case and everything like that. But it's like Paul notices that Festus is kind of pandering to the Jews. And I guess this happens in politics, right? Where, where unrighteous judgments are passed because people are pandering to a certain group of people. So here, Festus is pandering to the Jews. So he's trying to trick Paul into saying, well, do you want to come and be judged by me under my jurisdiction? You know, um, but the reason why he's doing that is because he knows the Jews will want him to do that. Right? So it's like he's sort of pandering to the Jews here. But what does Paul say? Paul say, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. So he's saying, I'm not going to be judged by the Jews, because I know in Rome I have a right to appeal to Caesar. I have a right to the court system and the law system that is within Rome. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Right? So he's not saying, like, hey, I'm, it's not that I don't think these laws, laws should be there, law and order. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. Right? So he's saying, you can't deliver me into, unto the Jews if I've done nothing wrong as a Roman citizen. I appeal unto Caesar. So it's similar to today. Like if you disagree with a court, you have the right to appeal to the Supreme Court. To appeal, uh, I think it's Supreme and then High Court. To the higher courts to have your case heard. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. So we see here Paul knowing his rights in the country that he lives in and people trying to infringe upon those rights, he doesn't necessarily just have to do whatever Festus tells him to do because he knows he has a higher right in the country of Rome at, the mo at that time that he can appeal to. So it shouldn't be seen as him not being a law abiding a citizen when he actually is. He is abiding within the laws, but there are people trying to you know, remove those rights from him. So that's why in Australia, just to touch on a few other topics, right? Like just some practical examples in Australia. That's, that's the end of my sermon. You know, we, we don't have a king in Australia. This is what you need to understand. We don't have a king. The politicians are not kings. What do I mean by that? They don't just rule over a land and just make law, any laws they want. In our country, our politicians are subject to the constitution of Australia and to the laws that reside in Australia. That's why they can't just do whatever they want. They can't just tell you to do whatever they want. You have a right in this country to disobey unlawful commands from the police, from politicians, even laws are, that are unlawful. Right now, can somebody decide, you know, hey, well, I'm just going to keep these, these extra laws because I don't want to make my life troublesome. Yeah, I understand those things. But if somebody wants to stand up, like you have the constitutionalists out there that say, well, I don't want, I don't want to obey these laws because, you know, they say, well, because you're breaking the laws of the constitution. Are they doing wrong? That's the question. They're not doing wrong. You know, if that's the case, 
you know, because I don't know, I don't know everything about all the laws in Australia and whatnot. But the point I'm making is people who are breaking laws and they believe it's because the constitution gives them that right and the law that is actually passed is unconstitutional. We as Christians, knowing how the world ought to work, should not be condemning those people as breaking the law or as rebellious and whatnot when they have a case that should be heard. So it's those sort of things where, where sometimes Christians get mixed up too and just be like, well, they're like, well, it is a law. It's not contrary to God's law. Why aren't you keeping it? Well, it's because sometimes laws that get passed in our country don't abide by the laws in our country either, right? And people have a right to disobey those laws. So we think about the rights that we have. If we have an infringement on the right to political discussion. If, if they're infringing on our right to freedom of religion. I guess that one goes with contrary to God's law too. But, um, you know, you know, if they, like forced vaccination and things like that. You know, if they, if they try and do these things, we have a right to protest these things and disobey the government because we have certain rights given by God that our country recognizes and we can go against if they pass these laws. And I'll just end on this. Uh, I'll just uh, finish on um, this example. But um, this, is, this is one that people also argue about as well in terms of paying income tax. So, you know, people say, oh, yeah, well, we should pay tax. But there are a lot of people that believe, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to pay income tax. So there are certain taxes because they believe income taxes are unconstitutional and all this sorts of stuff. So don't get into this frame of mind that just because, you know, God says, hey, we ought to pay tribute, that therefore everybody out there who's saying, oh, you shouldn't pay this tax, you shouldn't pay this tax, is necessarily breaking the law either. Because there are people out there that believe, hey, these sort of things is an example of an unconstitutional tax and therefore we shouldn't even have to pay those. Now whether you go down that route and want to fight that fight is a whole other topic because you know, obviously in, in America people have tried to go down that fight. Ken Hoven went down that fight, you remember? So he, he, he probably was in that boat as well where he's like, well this is, this is outside of the government, this is a church thing, we shouldn't have to pay taxes, our, our people shouldn't have to pay taxes and then he was thrown in jail for that. But was he disobedient to God's laws in doing that? No. Probably not. You know, I mean, we're not we're experts on the United States laws, but chances are he wasn't breaking actually any laws. It's just the IRS came after him. And other people as well who have, who have gone against income tax laws because they, they believe the income tax laws that are being passed are unconstitutional and they shouldn't be there. We shouldn't have to pay them. They try and fight that fight. Hey, all the best to them, right? I support them in that fight. Whether or not you personally decide to do it and go through that trouble, obviously there's always a question of how convenient it is for you to, you know, at what, what point are you going to say enough is enough and stand up for that and, and be willing to fight that fight? That's up for everybody to decide. But what I'm trying to say here in this sermon is, you know, don't just promote a blind obedience to the government, to other people or to your children. You know, I don't want any of us to grow up and just think, you know, just this blind obedience, this blind allegiance to a country and to just promote that to our children. I don't want my children growing up just having a blind allegiance to Australia. I want my children growing up having an allegiance to Jesus Christ and knowing what's right and wrong. And like we're talking about today, knowing when to disobey, knowing when to obey, knowing the laws in their country, knowing when to disobey unlawful laws as well. So let's pray that God will give us the courage and the wisdom to live as free Christians in this country and stand against oppression. Otherwise, you know, the freedoms that you take for granted right now you know, in this country, they may not be there when our children grow up. All right, so let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the, the bold examples we see in the Bible of people standing against oppression. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to have this boldness. Um, Lord, help us to not cower in fear. And I pray, Lord, of all the people to stand up and fight in this world, I pray, Lord, that it will be your people. I'm so happy, Lord, seeing the Bible read at the, the Victorian protests. Um, and I just pray, Lord, that your people would rise up out of the shadows, that they would wake up, Lord. That, Lord, we ought to be leading this fight. We ought to be the ones in the light showing people how to stand up for what's right 
So I pray, Lord, that you would raise up people uh, amongst your kingdom to, to do just that. To help us, Lord, we need courage, we need boldness. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.